Justin Trudeau's chief of staff there during a two and a half hour session with MPs at the House Committee today testifying on Chinese meddling in Canadian elections. Uh, they are taking questions on media reports of alleged election interference. It's a committee appearance she tried to avoid citing the national security limitations um, on what she's able to say. MPs wanted details about what she and the Prime Minister knew about alleged interference and unsurprisingly she she had little to offer publicly on the matter. Where does her testimony take the House Committee investigation into elections interference and could Telford have offered more insight without breaching national security laws. Let's bring in two people who know the job very well. Former Chief of Staff to Paul Martin, Tim Murphy, is here. He's now the CEO and Managing Partner at Macmillan and David uh, and Macmillan LLP. And David McLaughlin is the former Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. He is now the President and CEO of the Institute on governance. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank hey you there. for being there. Um, I'm imagining you going, phew, thank God it wasn't me, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it would have been very, uh, very exciting. So, David, let me start with you. Um, we talked about this this week and said, look, there's so much she won't be able to say, yet she was criticized for not saying what mm -hmm. she wasn't. Did, did, did she, could she have pushed the envelope a little bit more? Could she have been more forthcoming without breaching the law? Probably not. Uh, there may be some instances here and there where she had a bit of wiggle room, but at the end of the day, that wouldn't have changed the overall narrative in the sense of that she was always going to be criticized for not being open and offering up enough. So it wouldn't matter. There was n I didn't get the sense that there's any particular nugget or tidbit or something that she was withholding. In fact, uh, she spent a fair amount of time at the outset, as you recall, you know, kind of schooling the, the committee in terms of this is what I'm allowed to say, this is what I'm not allowed to say. So she provided a lesson in governance, if you will, in how the, uh, you know, the process works and how, you know, uh, she in her role with the Official Secrets Act, Conflict of Interest Act, Con uh, Cabinet Confidential obligations she is really quite fettered in what she can say so at the end of the day as we say back home in the Maritimes I don't think it really changed the water on the beans right this is we are no further ahead but we're no further behind you know so so Tim is it fair to say that uh, she did no damage it, 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 is that is that fair what was your impression is it was it a ma okay she testified but I didn't learn anything well I, I mean uh, yes I think we didn't learn anything we didn't already know I actually think it was, a, a, frankly, a bit of a mistake for the uh, opposition to go after Katie Telford because it allows the government to, you know, kind of say, "Hey, we put someone up to answer all these questions, and uh, that person actually isn't accountable to the electorate." That all being said, I think you know you saw like Ward Elcock, the former head of CSIS, who basically said, you know, she answered as thoroughly as she could given the constraints under the law that she operated under. In fact, you could see her at certain points straining to want to answer the question because I'm sure she had a good answer, but being restricted by the virtue of her obligation. So I think at the end of the day, we came out of this knowing what we went into it, uh, and we may have all just wasted two and a half hours. I don't know if I can, okay, I know what you mean because maybe a few of my colleagues think <laughs> like you. Uh, that's two and a half hours you'll never get back in your life. But but you know, chiefs of staff, depending on the chiefs of staff, are pretty powerful people on Parliament Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they're not accountable to Parliament, but but nonetheless, they have become you know sure. just people that are that you have that you have to contend with. Probably sometimes even more powerful than some junior ministers. Mm -hmm. um, so was it a fair thing for the opposition to push and push and push to get her to sit in that chair and answer their questions? Well, from the opposition's perspective, absolutely, they'd say it was fair because she is so powerful and the position has grown to be so powerful. Yes. I mean, political staff are, they're called exempt staff for a reason. They're exempt from the traditional rules of engagement as public servants. They are not, as you say, accountable to Parliament in any way. They're accountable and answerable only to their minister, to the Prime Minister. That didn't fundamentally change there, anything there. So to that extent, it, it's, a, you know, it's a, a further erosion of that classic principle that we have. At the end of the day, it's ministers and the prime minister who should be answering in the house. To that extent, I would say that there are perhaps uh, in a couple of instances, uh, Ms. Telford actually reminded them of that by saying the, uh, something like, to the effect or the words of the prime minister read everything. He saw everything. He, he kind of knew everything. And that is, in fact, whether she meant it or not, she's putting accountability back on him 
for in which where it should legitimately reside. So he is accountable for the decisions. He's accountable for what he read and what he didn't r r read, and for what he knew and what he didn't know. And that's where ultimately, from a government political narrative, opposition narrative, that's where it's uh, it's going to have to go. So Tim, you know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of talk that, uh, about people not now being very worried about uh, alleged interference, uh, a little bit because of the media, a little bit because of perhaps the not so uh, brilliant strategy, communication strategy from the liberals, and perhaps a little bit from the kind of questions and, and, and where the questions are coming from, from the opposition. So I'm wondering if you think that today the Canadian public was well served. Well, I, if your objective is to enhance the confidence of the Canadian electorate in the integrity of our electoral system and democratic process, I'm not sure today advanced that objective. And to your point, I actually think uh, there has been a lot of almost misinformation, partisanship, uh, you know, maybe sometimes even intentional blindness. I know the leader of the opposition refused to go and get confidential briefings. Of, of, briefings in order to be able to free to say certain things. So uh, I do think part of this uh, has been, you know, our uh, confidence has been undermined to some degree by the partisan way in which this issue is being dealt with. That being said, it's a real issue and a real concern. And, you know, over time, governments have done more and more to deal with it. Um, and I think, you know, we'll, we may speak to this, but I do think we've got to take more efforts to increase Canadians' confidence in a democratic and electoral system that we have, which I think is fundamentally sound. That doesn't mean we can't do more and be better at protecting it. Yeah, and they've all said uh, that that's all the time we have. And, and we've heard from, from CSIS, from the National Security Advisor, that the election was fair and square. And yet this seems to not, this issue just seems not to want to go away. So I have a feeling that we'll be talking about it again. Um, uh, David McLaughlin, Tim Murphy, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. And look, the weather is great. Let's go out there and play a little bit this weekend. <laughs> okay. And um, coming up, could a...